Okay, well, this lecture is largely about Sir Charles Villiers Stanford and his contribution to chamber music. I'm going to show you a series of slides very much about his life and his output. Um, the, this first set of sli uh, slides and illustrations uh, tell us something a little, a little bit about Stanford's early life. Well, he was born in Dublin in 1852, uh, and one might say that his earliest musical education was really through what he called the cradle and nursery of music in Ireland, which were the unusual two cathedrals, the national and city cathedrals of Dublin. Um, you can see there St. Patrick's uh, above and Christ Church below, where he studied largely under Sir Robert Prescott Stewart, you can see on the far right. Um, it was really through Stuart's offices that Stanford learnt his fundamental rudiments. Uh, and I think it was Prescott Stewart undoubtedly who spotted Stanford's initial prodigious gifts as a composer. Um, probably more crucial, however, is the figure of the young man you can see in the middle. This is Josef Joachim, the Hungarian violinist, who spent a, a huge amount of his life really traveling around Br the British Isles. When he, wasn't, um, when he wasn't in Germany or in Hungary or Austria performing, he spent a good deal of time um, in London and throughout the major cities of the United Kingdom, um, which of course at that time included Ireland, um, and um, this was partly because I think Joachim had personal connections in this country with his family, but um, there was also, I think, uh, money to be made. And of course, not only was he a regular visitor to London, to Cambridge, to Oxford and Glasgow and other cities, he was also a major, uh, he also um, uh, visited Dublin. Uh, and it was actually at the age of no, no more than six that Stamford met Joachim for the first time. And of course, one of the things that Joachim was a great um, uh, advocate of was not just as a solo violinist in works such as, as Bach and Brahms and Beethoven and Mendelssohn, which he was obviously well known, but he was a great advocate for chamber music. And he almost certainly played in chamber music when he came to, to Dublin, playing with some of the string players of the city. Um, so I think the seeds, the, 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 the natural orbit, the natural admiration for chamber music was sown in these early years, in the 1850s. Um, of course, Stanford went to school in Dublin, but when it came to the time to go to university, he decided not to go to Trinity College Dublin, which had been the general haunt of many of his family who were all very highly educated legal people. Um, he wanted to, to, to study music actually, but uh, actually he, he elected to go to Cambridge University where he studied classics. I don't think he gave very much time to the study of classics while he was there. I think he managed to scrape a third class degree uh, in 1874. But in 1870, he was one of the very first students to gain uh, an organ scholarship, and that was to Queen's College, Cambridge, as you can see on the left there. Um, and perhaps most fortuitous, of course, that when he went to Queen's was that he was able to acquaint himself with William Sterndale Bennett, who was probably the, still one of the most um, admired composers um, in England. He was head of the Royal Academy of Music, professor of music at Cambridge, um, the author of some fine chamber works indeed, also um, a number of symphonic works and overtures, um, was greatly admired in Leipzig at the Gewandhaus, where he in fact turned down a job as the conductor there. And I think Stanford hugely admired Sterndale Bennett, um, at the composer's uh, centenary in 1916. He wrote a, a quite extended article on uh, William Sterndale Bennett for the musical Quarterly. Such was the level of his admiration. Um, well, from Queen's, interestingly, 
Um, Stanford, what they call migrated to Trinity College, Cambridge in 1873. The organist at the college was an ailing man, John Larkin Hopkins. Uh, so Stanford stepped into the breach and um, moved his college to, to Trinity. And here I think he got more opportunities for chamber music. He was, of course, head of music in chapel. Um, and um, it was rather unusual, this young man dining with all the fellows at high table, even though he hadn't at that time even got a degree. Um, but it was really through the, the offices of Sterndale Bennett, um, who clearly uh, vouched for Stanford's great gifts, that the fellows at Cambridge were prepared to offer Stanford the opportunity to go to Germany to study privately in 1874, 1875, 1876, precisely in fact the last six months of each of those years. Um, now, of course, Sterndale Bennett had many connections with Leipzig. Leipzig was the chamber music capital of the German-speaking world. It was where you published all your chamber music. It was, in fact, where you published a great deal of your orchestral music and leader as well. But um, particularly, I mean, uh, most of the major publishers, German publishers, such as Peters, Breitkopf and Hertel, um, Payne and so on, all had their main offices in Leipzig. So Stanford went to um, Leipzig in 1874, where he studied with Karl Reinach, who was a, a friend of Sterndale Bennett's. Um, I think in the initial stages, he found Reinach quite stimulating, but as time went on, um, he described Reinach as rather desiccated, uh, so dry, in fact, that, you know, he, 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 he was perhaps less helpful in the creative part as he was in the technical part of composition. But in fact, it, it's, um, I think poor old Reinecker has had somewhat of a bad press, really. We're going to hear a work, the flute sonata, um, in the programme this weekend, which I think shows Reinecker to actually have been really a, a, a truly romantic composer uh, and somebody who learned a great deal from Schumann and Mendelssohn. Well, Leipzig was, I think, hugely formative on Stanford. He did, in fact, start writing chamber music while he was here. Um, he wrote a, a piano trio in G, which is now lost. Um, and from Leipzig, he then moved on to Berlin for the last year in 1876, largely through the offices and persuasion of Josef Joachim. Um, and really then when he returned to Cambridge, in January 1877, he was in the first flushes of his maturity. Um, he produced um, a cello sonata in A major, a very fine work for Robert Hausmann, whom he'd met in Germany. Um, and it was also through the offices of this very important gentleman, Edward Danreuter, who happened to be the mentor of uh, Stanford's great contemporary Hubert Parry that at least one if not I think two possibly of Stanford's works were premiered here um, in Bayswater this is 12 Orm Square Bayswater um, it's not the original building that was bombed in 1940 but it has a green plaque on the outside saying this is where Dan Reuter's house was and he had this studio famous studio here where quite a lot of British chamber works were performed for the first time. So Paris chamber works were performed here. So were Stanford's first chamber works. Now, um, this would have been in the late 1870s, um, but uh, moving on perhaps a little bit more from the 1870s, we move to 1882, 1883. And this is the Royal College of Music in Kensington Gore. This was the original building, not the rather more famous Scottish baronial building that you see in Prince Consort Road, just round the corner. That's where the Royal College of Music moved when it no longer had the capacity for its students in this rather smaller building. Um, but here, I think um, not only did Stanford um, 
uh, teach composition. He was, after all, the head of composition at the Royal College. He encouraged chamber music amongst the students, and he encouraged it particularly in the composition uh, by composition students and, of course, players too. Um, this, I think, was highlighted by, um, again, his... Um, uh, his meetings with Joachim, um, and of course um, at Cambridge where he was still um, the head of chapel at Trinity College, Cambridge. Now Stanford was also organising chamber works for the Cambridge University Musical Society. He'd after all uh, had a meteoric rise as the conductor in the early 1870s when he was a young student but on his return from Germany in 1877, he really started in earnest to boost not only the orchestral and choral concerts, which were large scale, but also at the old Cambridge Guildhall, there were a good number of chamber works. And Stanford used to appear in these as pianist alongside Joachim during his travels to England uh, and also to Robert Hausman. You can see at the bottom of that slide with his cello, sitting next to, of course, no less than Johannes Brahms. Um, and that photograph is probably as close as we can get to the young Stanford at this time. And Stanford was playing a good deal of Schumann, a um, lot of the big Brahms concerted chamber works like the piano quintet, uh, the, the three piano quartets and so on. Uh, many of these with Joachim. So, you know, this whole interest was really in Stanford's blood, very much in his DNA, you might say. Um, and of course, uh, during this period of the late 1870s and 1880s at Cambridge, Stanford produced a good number of his own chamber works. Probably the greatest work of this time, I would say, is the Piano Quintet in D minor, Opus 25. This is probably amongst one of some of Stanford's greatest works for uh, greatest instrumental works. Um, you can see this um, a, a, a rather eminent recording by the RTE Vambra Quartet with P Piers Lane there, which was made some years ago. Above it is a famous picture of the Joachim Quartet. And the Joachim Quartet was really a fixture of music making in the last 20 years, early, very early years of the 20th century as well, both in Cambridge and Oxford and London. These were red letter days. These would fill the, the, the chamber music hall of the St. James's Hall in London and also the Guild Hall in Cambridge. And Stanford wrote this great uh, work, Piano Quintet, for Joachim and the, and, the, and the quartet, and it is dedicated to them. Now, this whole chemistry of Joachim uh, and indeed his pupils, I think helps make up so much of what I think we, we should understand um, as part of the culture of Stanford's chamber music. Um, many of Joachim's uh, students, his, his students in Berlin uh, came and settled in London and in Cambridge, thanks to his recommendation. Um, the Cambridge Quartet, led by a man called Richard Gompertz. Fortunately, I don't have a photograph of him, um, but he formed the Cambridge Quartet, for which Stanford wrote at least his first two string quartets, um, the first in G, the second in A minor, uh, and they were, I think, extremely important. The third string quartet, which dates from the mid-1890s, was again written for the Joachim Quartet. So one can see so many strong connections. Um, the fourth quartet was dedicated to one of um, Joachim's most eminent pupils, Johann Secundus Kruser. He was in fact Australian, um, but obviously from German extraction. He studied with Joachim, was one of his greatest, I think most accomplished pupils. Um, so not only was this work, the fourth quartet, written for Kruser, um, but another work we're going to hear in the festival, the wind nonet, um, well the nonet for wind and strings, um, opus 95, 
is, is also a, a, a delightful work, and that was premiered by Cruiser's Quartet and additional players. So we, we have this strong Joachim-based culture, I think, German chamber music, but also very much influenced by, I think, Joachim's friends, his pupils, and so on. Um, we could go on and think about you know, um, the, the fifth quartet of, fifth string quartet of Stanford, which was dedicated to Joachim, uh, his, the memory of Joachim after his death in 1907. That's, a, again, a, yet another very fine work. So besides this, this culture of Joachim and Stanford, um, other things I think were brought to bear that influenced Stanford's composition of chamber works more and more. Um, one of them was uh, this gentleman on the right, uh, Mr. Cobbett, um, who is perhaps most famous for his cyclopedic survey of chamber music that came out during the 20th century it was in three volumes in its second edition. Um, Cobbett was a businessman, but his greatest passion was music. And in around 1905, um, he instituted a competition for chamber music. Uh, and this was to write fantasy-like pieces, um, perhaps linking them up with the sort of fantasy type structures that had once been composed during the Elizabethan period for vials. Um, Cobbett wanted to try and create some kind of new Elizabethan uh, work that was contrapuntal in the style of the, the chamber music uh, tended to um, engender. And um, he, anyway, he gave a good deal of money for uh, the composition of these works. Uh, and in 1905, the first composition took place. Uh, the, the prize winner was a man called William Yates Hurlstone. We're going to hear his uh, fantasy quartet in this weekend's programme. And we're going to hear one of the runners up by Frank Bridge as well, his fantasy quartet. Um, so Cobbett is important. Stanford undoubtedly had a major part in the formation of this competition. Uh, and another chamber work that features in this weekend's program, the, um, the little clarinet fantasia for clarinet and string quartet, I think was almost certainly influenced again by Cobbett and the world of Cobbett's fantasy quartets. So that's another important link, I think, um, for Stanford. Um, another revelation for Stanford certainly was his meeting with the gentleman you can see with the clarinet at his lips. This is Richard Mulfeld. Um, Richard Mulfeld was uh, a clarinetist in the German Meiningen Orchestra. And he was undoubtedly the influence behind that flowering of clarinet works, um, which Brahms produced uh, in the 1890s, the, the two clarinet sonatas, the clarinet trio, and perhaps above all the most, you know, the magnificent clarinet quintet. Well, Stanford knew all of these works, of course, extremely well, um, but he met um, Mühlfeld in 1902 when um, the Mining and Orchestra paid a visit to London. Um, and as a result, Stanford uh, produced his clarinet concerto, which, um, although we're not hearing that this weekend, um, is I think one of the finest clarinet concertos um, of the late Romantic period, without any doubt. Uh, I think to Stanford Chagra, Mühlfeld so for some reason decided not to play it uh, and held on to the score for some time before returning it. Uh, Stanford was not pleased, but instead he handed the concerto to the gentleman you can see in the bottom right hand corner, um, a great English um, exponent of clarinet music, Charles Draper. Um, and it was Draper, in fact, who then performed the clarinet concerto for the first time. This was not actually the first work that Stanford had written for clarinet. Um, you can see that rather unusual instrument and the clergyman in the right hand corner. This is Francis Galpin, um, whom Stanford had known at Cambridge as part of the Cambridge University Music Society. 
Um, and in fact, it was for Galpin that Stanford wrote his three intermezzi for clarinet, which are still very often performed by clarinetists today. Um, after the first performance of the clarinet concerto, it was taken up by uh, various other um, clarinetists. Um, one of them was Frederick Thurston. You can see there on the back of that CD. Uh, Thurston was perhaps one of the greatest exponents of English clar clarinet concertos in the 20th century. And his marriage to a very young Thea King, you can see there below, uh, was a co celebre at the time. He was very much older than she was. Um, and in fact, uh, she was a fine clarinetist. Uh, and um, the clarinet um, fant fantasia that we're going to hear in the weekend's program was actually first performed by Thea King um, uh, on, on, a, on a recording for Hyperion. Um, so we have both of these, husband and wife, to thank really for the uh, exposition of Stanford's clarinet music. Um, the, one of the interesting things about the chamber music for Stanford is though that while he also, he, he undoubtedly wrote works for performers in mind that he had, uh, people like Mufelt, Draper, and so on. And one can mention the clarinet sonata, which we're also hearing the program. Um, he, I think, felt that chamber music was also something of a kind of intellectual release for him. Um, and um, the last three string quartets did not get published in Stanford's lifetime. Um, and yet he undoubtedly still felt the need to compose them. Now, the one string, qu string quartet of Stanford's eight works for the idiom um, was composed in 1910 at this rather grand hotel in a place called Cholliford in Northumbria, which um, is not far from actually where I live. And um, one of the things that Stanford used to do on a habitual annual, annual basis, along with his, um, his Irish compatriot, the singer Harry Plunkett Green, was fish. Plunkett, Plunkett Green wrote several books on fishing. This was where he, I think, got his, his recreation. And certainly so did Stanford. Um, and this hotel, the George Hotel, was traditionally a fishing hotel. You can see the South Tyne here uh, alongside the river and the Rome, this rather magnificent Roman bridge. Um, well, the sixth quartet was composed here. Um, uh, I think all four movements were fairly rapidly composed here during a fishing holiday. Now, this sixth quartet um, uh, was, was, I think, virtually unknown. I'm not even sure it was played over during Stanford's lifetime. Um, but it is a rather unusual work. It's only in three movements, um, a fast, fast, first movement, a slower, rather more lyrical uh, inner movement that's very much influenced, I think, by the language of Stanford's Irish rhapsodies. They're not real folk tunes, but they're quite close to being. Uh, and then we have a tour de force in the final movement, which is really a kind of combination of a scherzo and a finale. And here, I think Stanford shows perhaps more than almost any other work I know, his brilliance for uh, counterpoint, where he's actually able to combine four separate thematic ideas all together in the extraordinary last section of this work. Um, so it was, it was barely known during his lifetime, but it has now started to get better known, um, largely through, um, I say this, 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 in, this greater interest in Stanford's music, but also very much in Stanford as a composer of chamber music. Um, in the last few years, the SOM label, as you can see here, has recorded all eight of the quartets. Um, many of them are first recordings, not entirely all of them, but most of them are. And they reveal an extraordinary range of, I think, not only technical, but thematic and artistic achievement. 
And I think also something of how much he believed in the challenge of the string quartet uh, as an idiom. When you think he, his first two date from 1891, um, the, the next from around 1896 for Joachim, the fourth is from about 1903 for Cruiser, as I mentioned before, the fifth in memoriam of Joachim, and then the last three um, were, I think, written almost for his own satisfaction. Um, but they are all magnificent works. Number seven is, is a very fine work. The num number eight uh, is a very a beautiful, challenging, rather melancholy piece. And in, in connection, I think, with these, these quartets, Stanford also produced two string quintets, you can see there at the bottom of the right, right hand corner of the slide, um, which uh, be almost belong together as a set. Um, they date from around 1906. Um, and they were both written with Joachim in mind again. Um, and um, I, think, uh, I think Joachim tried them over in Berlin. Of course, by the following year, he was dead. But um, the first string quartet, string quintet uh, was only ever published in a form of, of instrumental parts and has received very few performances. It has been recorded by the um, RTE quartet as well. Um, but the second string quintet was unpublished and remained unpublished and I think uh, received one performance before it was recorded here by the Dante and Endelian quartets. Um, it's, I think, an absolutely stunning work. Um, so, so generally speaking, Stanford was a very uh, quality producer of chamber music throughout his life. And um, uh, not only did he produce string quartets, but there are, say, three, two piano quartets, three piano trios, uh, there's all this wonderful clarinet music um, and there are various sonatas, two sonatas for cello, two sonatas for violin. Uh, and of course, this wonderful uh, nonet serenade, which he wrote uh, for Cruiser. Um, he, he is a, a magnificent uh, composer, understands the idiom, I think, perhaps as, as, as any great master of chamber music would. Um, they have a lighter touch, perhaps, than the Brahms uh, quartets, the Brahms chamber works. Um, and they're instilled again with this interesting Irish lyricism, which I think is something peculiar to Stanford, something perhaps of, of a more national nature, and of course something that reflected his interest in the Irish traditional repertoire. I hope you enjoy the Stanford chamber works this weekend. They are undoubtedly a treasure trove. <laughs>